Well, good morning again. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to, uh, we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 6 and chapter 7 out of the Old Testament, and we'll be reading some of those passages here in, in just a little bit. You know, we've been in this series uh, about real life and real issues, and today we're going to look at another one of those. Uh, we've been looking at Bible characters, and we're going to look at a guy by the name of Achan today. You know, it was in, in November of 1992, okay, this goes back a little ways, but a tenant farmer by the name of Peter Watling, he uh, lived in the village of Hoxney in Suffolk, England, and he lost his hammer in a field, and so he thought, he couldn't find it, and so he thought, well, I'm going to call my friend Eric Laws. And so he did, and Eric Laws came over with his metal detector and began to search the field where the farmer had lost the hammer. Well, while searching with his metal detector, Mr. Laws began to find a whole lot more than a hammer. In this field, he started to find silver spoons. I mean, solid silver spoons. And he found gold jewelry and numerous gold and silver coins. And after finding several items, they both decided that they should call the, uh, the landowner and also the police. And so they did. Well, the next day, a team of archaeologists came out with their metal detectors and they searched the entire field in one day. And they recovered items that dated all the way back to the fourth and fifth centuries. Most of the hoard was recovered from a decayed uh, single chest and it consisted, this is part of it, but it consisted of 14,865 Roman gold, silver, and bronze coins, approximately 200 items of silver tableware, and also gold jewelry. And these objects are actually on display at the British Museum in London. And in 2018, this treasure was valued at $3.8 million dollars. Okay. Wow. And by the way, okay, just so you know, they did find the farmer's hammer <laughs> and it's displayed along with everything else in the museum. Now I like this story. Okay. Because I have a metal detector. Okay. And so if you ever lose a hammer in a field, you give me a call quick and I will come right over and begin searching, okay? <laughs> well, today we're going to learn about some buried treasure. And this treasure, though, was taken by Achan. And it just kind of worked out that it kind of rhymed that way. But it was taken by Achan, and uh, God told that he really wasn't supposed to be taking any treasure at all, but he did. Now, i got to set this all up, so just kind of go along with me. We're going to read uh, several scriptures here together, and uh, then we're going to hop right into all the application. But in the Old Testament book of Joshua, we learn how the Israelites, okay, they defeated the city of Jericho through the power of God. And as you might remember, you know, they marched around the city one time for six days, you know, in a row, and then they would treat back to their campsite. Well, I want to read from Joshua 6, and I'm going to start reading in verse 15, and here's what it says. It says, On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold... And the articles of bronze and iron are sacred, excuse me, sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took 
the city. Now I go to chapter 7 now in just verse 1. It says, But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, and the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. After defeating the town of Jericho, they set their sights on the next town, and it was called Ai. The report came back that not all the fighting men would even be necessary because of its smaller size, and so they decided to send like 3,000 men to conquer this city. But to their complete amazement and their complete surprise, the Israelites were getting defeated. And 36 soldiers were killed in the process. Joshua and the Israelites, okay, they were just devastated by this loss. And they wondered what in the world is going on because against Jericho, a much bigger force, they did not lose one single person. Now I want to read from chapter 7 and I'm going to start in verse 10. It says there that the Lord said to Joshua, okay, because they were all laymenting this whole thing, and Joshua, he tore his clothes in grief. And in verse 10 says, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies, and that would be the town of Ai. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward, clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward, family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward, man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua, he did just as the Lord commanded and through God's miraculous power, the Bible doesn't say it in the text, but it's at least conjectured that they may have used the casting of lots because that was used different times. And the Lord directed the casting of lots. And sure enough, Joshua chose the tribe and he chose the clan and he chose the family and he chose the man, Achan, as the one who had sinned. Now in Joshua 7, go all the way down to verse 19, and here's what it says. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder... A beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned it from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley 
of Achor ever since, and Achor means trouble. As we consider these events today, there are two observations that I want to make about sin, okay? And here's the very first observation that we all need to be aware of for us personally, and that is no one is immune to temptation and the attraction of sin. Martin G. Collins wrote this. He said, temptation is an appeal to think or do something contrary to God's law. We are drawn away, he says, from truth, virtue, and God's standards of righteousness. And he said, desires are forces of attraction in the wrong direction. He said, we long for it, crave it, covet it, and want it. He said, we are enticed and attracted when we are offered, he gave two examples of reward or pleasure. In April of 2018, there were uh, three men who were arrested. They were sentenced without parole uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Well, what did they do? Well, they had devised a plan that would lure and entice their victims with ads online that promised a good time, okay? And these people were instructed to go to certain hotels or certain houses or certain apartment complexes. Only when the person arrived, the co-conspirators were lying in wait, and they would come out with real and fake guns. And so they ambushed these people, they threatened to kill them, and they took all of their money and their electronic devices. I want to say that Satan has all kinds of plans. All kinds of plans up his sleeve to entice all of us to sin as well. I want you to think about the attraction, okay, the desire of physical pleasure, the attraction or desire of more money, a relational happiness, being accepted by other people, acquiring more and more things, uh, fulfilling sexual desires outside of marriage, getting revenge on people, and a hundred other forms of enticing bait. Listen, it can lure us away from doing what is right in the eyes of God. And listen, when you bite down, man, you bite down on that desire, hook, line, and sinker, what does the scripture say? It says that it gives birth to sin. I think sin, it seems to promise so much, doesn't it? But it ends, us, it ends up robbing us of the very thing we were looking for. Joy, happiness, peace. And so many other things. The Bible says this about sin. And I think this is so important. I want you to listen very carefully to what it says in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, okay? But each person, just think about yourself. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. And enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Here's my question. Uh, What is it that actually ends up causing us to do something that's sinful in our life? Well, I just want to use Achan as an example. And, And I want to observe three progressive things that can happen, okay? Here they are. Here's progressive cause number one, and that is I am dissatisfied with my current circumstances. Now listen, Aiken, we got to think about Aiken, okay? He was a part of a younger generation, and he would have been like 20 or under, that, that kind of generation uh, that would have experienced many years of wandering in the wilderness because of his parents' generation who did not believe that God could conquer their enemies in the land of Canaan. And you can read all about that in Numbers 13. During this 40-year punishment of wandering in the wilderness because of that sin, Deuteronomy 29.5 says this, okay? Yet the Lord says... During the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. In Exodus chapter 16 and verse 35, it says the Israelites ate manna 40 years. 
until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. Wow, think about it. Man, 40 years of eating the same food. Wearing the same clothes. Wearing the same shoes. You're not able to save up any money for the future. Do you think you might be dissatisfied with your current circumstances? I mean, no Texas Roadhouse, folks. There's not going to be any Kohl's to go shopping at. No Walmart. I mean, it's going to be right, right down horrible. <laughs> You see, Achan's dissatisfaction with his current circumstances is really what led him to take some of this treasure for himself, even though God had said that nobody was to take anything because what was taken this day was to be devoted to him and him alone as a tribute to God for their first victory in the land of Canaan. In Joshua 7, 21, okay, as Achan takes responsibility for what he did, what, is this, what did he say? He said, I saw, think about it, the eyes, I saw. He says, I saw the plunder. Oh, I saw the beautiful robe. I saw five pounds of silver. In today's market, that's like $19,000. He says, I saw over one, I took over one pound of gold. That's like over $23,000 in today's market. Probably more. I don't know that I did that one right. I got to think about that this morning. But what I want you to think about the seeing I saw combined with the dissatisfaction in his life created a powerful moment of temptation. Now, as people living in the 21st century, you know what? We can be dissatisfied with our current circumstances too. Maybe you're not satisfied with your current marriage. Maybe you're not satisfied with your current income your current level of happiness, your current job, your current boss. Maybe you're not satisfied with the current leadership of the church, your current problem, your current fashion. <laughs> You've been wearing your clothes way too long. You know? And a dozen other scenarios. And guess what? Man, when you least expect it, there comes that moment when you see something and it's missing with your, mixing with your dissatisfaction in life over something. And it can just create a powerful moment of temptation where choices of right and wrong are set right before you. Which leads to progressive cause number two. Uh, not just seeing, okay, but the idea that Here's the second one. I am enticed and attracted to covet something that isn't mine to have or do. In Joshua 7, one of the things Achan also said was, I coveted them. Okay? In the Hebrew language, the word covet, it, it means long for. Uh, it means feel delight in. It means to desire. It means to be considered precious. And when Achan saw these things, he desired to have them for himself. In his commentary on Joshua, Francis Schaeffer made this comment. He said he took two kinds of things. Gold and silver, which suggests the sin of materialism on Achan's part. And a beautiful robe from Babylonia, which suggests the desire to be fashionable, successful, or chic. When Achan saw the robe displaying the intricate work and style of Babylon, he saw a chance to be like the world in its outwardly visible success and fashion and therefore took the garment. You know, I think about all that and I really don't think there's been a whole lot of things that's changed in the world since the days of Achan. I would say that materialism, that worldly success, and being fashionable are right at the top of things that people covet and desire today even to the point of making it their God. And that's why we really have to be careful that our desires, that they don't turn into a lust for what God has not seen fit to give us at the moment. Or a lust for what God has given other people, and I want that too. And then you got progressive cause number three. And that is I consciously decide to give into my sinful desires and do wrong. In Joshua 7, 21, what does Achan say? He says, I took them. And I get it, okay? I saw, I coveted or desire, I took. There's the progression 
that leads to sin. And this is where his dissatisfaction, okay, combined with his desire, led him to do what God said explicitly not to do. This is where his temptation, okay, became sin because he chose wrong. And I think we need to admit it right now that none of us here today are beyond having desires that can lead to sinful choices. That's why I think we need to even guard against the most innocent kind of desires and lustful wishes. Here's something the Bible says in Colossians 3, 1 to 2. It's in the New Testament. And then I read verses 5 to 10 too because uh, uh, Paul was speaking to Christians, so I think we got to keep that in mind. And here's what he told them. He said, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, uh, desires, and greed, which is idolatry. In other words, you're making that a God. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of of its creator. So listen, when you find yourself focused in our world, you, you begin to focus on earthly success. You begin to focus on, man, I want to be popular with other people. I, 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 you begin to focus on pleasure or money or revenge, or you think about things in the text, like you begin to focus on greed. You begin to focus on anger or malice or slander. You focus on filthy language or you're focusing on, I'm going to lie about this. Man, you need to kick that evil desire right out of your head. And you need to focus on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. When temptation comes on strong, I think we got to stop. We got to pray. And like the text kind of indicates we got to kill that evil desire that's going on in our head up here. Otherwise, we're going to make a wrong choice. There's not a single one of us in this room today that is immune to temptation and the attraction of sin. And so here's the next observation that I want to think that, I, that we all need to think about before we step over the line and we decide we're going to commit this sin. Here's what you need to remember. Sinful choices leave a trail of consequences. In January of 2019, after it snowed several inches, a young man by the name of Cody Lutz and his fiance and his future sister-in-law, they decided that they were going to build this, this huge snowman, okay? And, uh, and so they began, and uh, what they decided to do to use as a base, there was a large tree stump that was in the, in the yard. And so they got all the snow around the tree stump to make as the base. And then they built it higher and higher. And you can see how it's got a box hat on them. While they were building this thing, I mean, people were driving by and they were honking and waving, you know, and kind of saying, oh, we really like what you're doing. But apparently not everybody was a fan. Someone decided that they were going to destroy the snowman by running it over with their truck. But as they hit the snowman, there was that big, large stump underneath the snow. I mean, can you imagine the jolt they must have felt when they, when they <laughs> hit that stump? Oh, my lands. Cody Lutz, the guy, you know, that, that helped build it, he said, uh, what goes around comes around in bad ways and good ways, he said. He said, so I guess everyone learns a lesson here from Frosty. <laughs> Here's the valuable lesson I want us to learn today, okay? Sin can have the appearance of, of a fluffy, white, innocent snowman bursting with all kinds of pleasure as we hit our desired target. But underneath, there's a big old tree stump of unwanted consequences that we didn't see. 
And it gave us quite a jolt. And we sure wish we would have chosen differently. From the story of Achan, as we continue to learn about sin, here's a trail of consequences that I think we can still experience today when we sin. And we're using him as the example. Here's consequence number one, and that is my sin dishonors God. After, they, after the Israelites had to retreat in their battle against Ai, uh, Joshua, Joshua and other leaders, they were kind of dumbfounded as to why. And, and God speaks there in Joshua 7, 11, and 12. I'm going to read it again. And God told Joshua, he said, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. You know, surrounding the events of Achan here, I think we learn, uh, it's kind of a side lesson, but it goes underneath this one, and that is God takes sin very seriously, whether we do or not. He takes it very seriously because it dishonors his name. And what else does it dishonor? It dishonors what he has actually commanded us to do and how to live. You see, every time we choose to, to go against one of God's standards, God is just a little bit hurt by our disobedience. Think about it this way. Have you been dishonoring God by the way you talk about other people? Have you been dishonoring God with your decisions? Have you been dishonoring God with your attitude? Have you been dishonoring God with your ungratefulness? Have you been dishonoring God with dishonest activities? You see, I don't think we give this consequence a whole lot of thought when we choose to sin, but every time we do sin, it hurts God. And it dishonors his name. I mean, even Achan admitted in Joshua 7.20, he said to Joshua, he said, it is true. He said, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Here's consequence number two in the text, and that is my sin can hurt other people. You know, as, as Israel was preparing to defeat Jericho, okay, Achan would have heard these instructions from his commander. And here's part of the instructions. As they get ready to go against Jericho, the city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. But keep away from the devoted things so that you do not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel, Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. And since Israel... Israel uh, had this, this first victory in their conquest against Canaan here. All the spoils of Jericho were to be devoted to him. But then we find out that in Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, we find out that Achan's sin led to this trail of consequences. There were 36 men, soldiers, who died because of what he did. Think about those families. We also find in the text that it says, we didn't read it, but it says that the hearts of people melted. In other words, it's describing how they were just totally discouraged by this defeat. And it says that the leaders were stricken with grief and just total dismay over what was happening. You know, the consequences can be quite different today, but the consequences of sin can still hurt people. Wouldn't you agree with that? Man, if you decide to commit adultery, don't you think somebody's going to get hurt besides you? If you decide to allow your anger to get out of control, don't you think that's going to hurt somebody? If you decide to achieve goals in life through deception and lying and, you know, weaseling your way through to get what you want, don't you think people are going to be hurt in the process? If you gossip about people, if you steal from others, if you cheat, if you haul off and hit somebody, if you tear someone down with your words, don't you think that people are going to get hurt in the process? Well, sure they are. That's one of the consequences of sin. Here's the third thing I want to bring out, the third consequence, and that is my sin can bring disgrace to my family. 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it is worth mentioning that the family of Achan is mentioned three times in chapter 7. And when you look at chapter 7 and verse 1, it mentions the household of his parents, of his grandparents, and his great-grandparents. I want you to imagine all of, I don't know if he had brothers or sisters, okay? But I just want you to imagine all of his brothers and sisters. All of Achan's aunts and uncles and cousins that would have had to endure the shame of being related to Achan. They all knew who that was. And you know what? I think there are some forms of sin that can have far-reaching consequences to even our own family. I think of sins like divorce. Okay? I mean, we've talked about getting hurt. People are going to be hurting that. You know, your kids got to go to school. You know, what if stuff like that comes up? I think about when a murder has been committed. What kind of disgrace can that bring to a family? I think about sexual abuse. I think about verbal abuse. What kind of disgrace can that bring to a family? And then here's consequence number four. And that is my choice of sin can influence the decisions of my own family. We've got to remember that. In doing a little bit of background study on this, okay, I found out that in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, we learned that one of the laws of Israel would not allow innocent family members to be punished for the sins of their relatives. Okay? In this case, we discover that Achan, and then it also mentions his sons, and it mentions his daughters, and everything he owned was taken to the valley of Achor, and it was there that the nation of Israel stoned them all to death for their crime against God and the nation. The text doesn't come right out and say it, but I think it's only logical to conclude that his family must have been co-conspirators in taking the forbidden treasure or covering it up. And as the head of his household, Achan influenced his own family to commit a sin and hit that big tree stump of unwanted consequences. There's a website called reddit.com and there was a question asked there. Hey, what funny things, actions, or phrases do your kids repeat? And one mother said, you know, whenever my four-year-old starts to get upset that I am not immediately responding to her request. She says, I should not have to, have to ask you more than one time, Mom. I wonder where she heard that. You know, kids can be influenced through our words, through our actions in many ways. But listen, this is a, this is a serious thing here. The consequences of an ungodly influence can become a spiritual detriment to their very soul and their eternity. Now we're going to get a little heavy here, okay? But we are talking about sin, right? What if you decide to stop coming to church today? For whatever reason. Or let's just say that from two years now, Something happens, you know, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. And, and you just decide that you are going to stop going to church. How is that decision going to influence your family and their spiritual future? What if you decide to be unethical in various situations? And, you know, you kind of laugh about it at home and, oh, you know, wah, wah, you know, and talk about it. And it's known to the kids and your wife or your husband. I mean, how is that decision going to influence the way that your spouse and kids are going to handle themselves in the future? What if you decide to treat people with disrespect out there? Maybe you're actually cursing in front of your kids and you're cursing at other drivers driving around you. Or you're, you're, you, you make disrespectful comments because it seems like you are just waiting in line way too long, you know, for your food or to check out 
at whatever you're doing, and, and you're just reacting in a way that's not, not right. I mean, how is that going to affect and influence the way that your family members treat other people in the future? And what if you decide to miss church services for sports, for hobbies? We're going to miss church for multiple weekend trips, and we're going to miss church because the kid has a runny nose. And to be honest, it may be that you're in church like once every four to six weeks. I mean, how is that decision going to influence the way that your child is going to attend church when they become an adult? Will they even decide to come to church at all? Will your children end up going to hell because of the way that you choose to live today? Now, I know that's all pretty heavy, okay? But I think it's good to remember that your lifestyle is going to influence your family's character. And your lifestyle is going to influence the future decisions of your family. And could it be that you are not as committed to Christ and the church as what your parents were? And then what about the kids that follow? You see what I'm saying? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, it's, it's my prayer that you're going to open up everyone's heart today to just see the inside of their life with complete clarity. God's sin is a very serious issue before you. And, and Father, I pray that you would help us to take it serious. I pray, God, that you would help us today to look inside our own lives and see if there's some kind of sin that needs to be removed. And God, I, I do pray that you, your Holy Spirit would really convict us to understand that sin is against you. And it has its own share of consequences. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, I thank you for being good listeners because I went on just a little bit longer than normal, but here's how the next chapter in Joshua begins. It's chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. <laughs> Man, if Achan would have just waited just a little bit longer, you know? But once the Israelites got rid of the sin in their camp, guess what? The blessing of God returned, and they conquered the town of Ai. Here's what I want to ask you as we bring this all to a close. Is it possible that there is some sin in the camp of your life that needs to be removed today? Because the way it is right now, God's blessing on your life is at a minimum when you could be enjoying so much more. Maybe you feel like God hasn't been blessing your life. And in a sense, it's just kind of seemed like, man, it's just been one defeat after another. I think you should take a moment to look at your life. And is it possible that there is an ongoing sin that's been going on way too long that needs to be removed from your life. Now, with that being said, okay, I don't want you to read into what I'm saying here, you know, that, well, all your problems in life are due to personal sin. That is not what I'm saying. 
All I'm trying to get at is that sin can bring consequences to your life, and God wants you to repent. He wants you to ask Him for forgiveness, and He wants you to get back on the road of living for Him. That's what He wants. Now, we've got a decision time here, and this decision is for everybody. Is there some kind of sin that you need to be getting rid of today? Because it's going, been going on way too long. Maybe there's a decision that you need to decide to follow Jesus for the very first time because it's just something you've never done. That you need to repent, confess Him as Lord, and, and be baptized in His name. Maybe you need some prayer because you've been struggling. Listen, if you have a need, you feel free to come back. There'll be a few people back there. Let's stand and let's sing.